of the Ernest J. Gaines Center. And I would like to welcome everyone to our final book discussion for Who Gets to Vote, which is being hosted by the Edith Garland Dupre Library. The Edith Garland Dupre Library plays a large role in disseminating the history and culture of our area, including topics that are current and critical for our community. Our library is very rich in resources that support the research needs of our users, and book discuss discussions such as this one are one of the many who fully support the inst instructional research programs at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. We also provide we also use these types of programs to provide access to information for our entire community. These readings and book discussions have been funded by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities through the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Electoral Participation Initiative, which is administrated by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon. Foundation. This particular series was developed by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and is intended to engage members of the public in conversations on our history of voting in the United States. I want to welcome everyone who is joining us via YouTube on the library's YouTube channel and with the AOC Community Media's YouTube channel. And for tonight's discussion, we will be the, um, talking about the book Bending Toward Justice, The Voting Rights Act, and the Transformation of American Democracy by Gregory May. And our uh, moderator will be Dr. Theodore Foster. Dr. Theodore Foster earned a PhD in Black Studies from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And since the fall of 2019, has been an assistant professor of African American history at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. He researched right. political and historical memory within civil rights, black freedom, and racial progress narratives. Again, thanks everyone for attending and tuning in. And thank you, Dr. Foster, for your time and expertise on this topic. At this point, I hand it over to Dr. Foster. Thank you. Thank you, Shay, um, and thank you to the Dupree Library uh, for all of your work and applying for this grant, securing this grant in record time. I really, 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 really love librarians and archivists, and well, Shannon Woods is both. And um, without your work, uh, I could not teach. Um, without your work, I could not write, much less do research. So I sincerely appreciate um, the opportunity. Um, as well as I want to thank uh, LEH, uh, Louisiana Down to the Humanities. I think this program, Who Gets to Vote, is obviously incredibly timely. I think there's great room within the humanities to think about the um, work of history uh, and its you know, uh, presence with us today. So uh, welcome to all of you on the call and all of you on YouTube. I want to continue to shout out our uh, librarians by going to... Oh, can I get host uh, abilities to share my screen real quick? Um, I want to share my screen and go to the um, the website that you all put together on the Dupree Library website to check out the, the work that you all have done. Thank you. Here we go. Um, because I think we sleep often on uh, our librarians that help us read these books uh, a bit better. So if you go to library. Uh, louisiana.edu backslash who gets to vote, you'll see this excellent website that you can navigate to find the discussion guide for this book, which I'll be using a bit to guide our discussion today, but that's not all that's here. So we see about the series, zoom in a bit more, we'll click bending toward justice, aha, about the book. You can download the discussion guide here if you wanted to. Um, I'm not going to do that right now, but if you go down to the bottom of this website, you see additional information. We'll click research guide for the series, and there's this excellent trove of research our librarians put together for us. It has who gets to vote conversations on voting rights in America, um, 100 plus years of voting from the uh, League um, Voting League of Women. I know I'm getting that wrong. Um, please correct me, Shay, real quick. Um, but there's a lot League of, really of women voters. voters. League of Women Voters, thank you. Uh, this is an exhibit, uh, right? Um, but just excellent resources. Um, research in detail. I, you know, as I mentioned to my students, uh, several of whom are on the call, uh, 
being able to read a book without reading every word is a skill that will serve you in the future. I don't mean, you know, ignore the argument or ignore the evidence, but there's this excellent, you know, shortened, shortest approach to reading Bending Toward Justice. So if you're interested in getting the book, if you don't already have it, these are really good guides to getting your feet wet if you don't have time to read all 256 pages, as I'm sure everyone on the call did for today. Uh, I'm joking. It's okay if you didn't. I'm really, you know, curious your thoughts on the kind of Black history of people like the Honorable John Lewis, who passed just last year, uh, who's really central to this um, history of Selma, the history of voting rights uh, and Black history. So go to the website uh, and uh, peruse if you are interested in this topic. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, I should say at the beginning. Um, and after I provide some kind of framing remarks for the text, I want to go around the Zoom call and hear a bit more about uh, you all on the call so that I have a better understanding um, of, of your orientation to the book, uh, your impressions, and your questions that we can also send to, right? Um, so to begin, I want to uh, reflect on how our author of uh, Bending Toward Justice, the Voting Rights Act, and the Transformation of American Democracy, Dr. Gary May, who is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Delaware, begins and ends his book. Right? I often tell my students, like, let's just read from the back in order to have a better understanding of where the author lands. Right? Um, and it gets to this kind of general understanding about history and quote that I'm sure you're all familiar with um, in various iterations. George Santa, Santayana says, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I want to challenge that understanding of the past uh, tonight. But to begin, I want to turn to the last page of the book, uh, page 254, in which we see um, a photo, which I'll share on my screen right now, of President Barack Obama giving John Lewis the uh, Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor uh, a civilian can earn. And I'm just gonna read this full last paragraph because I think it's important for our understanding of uh, why the past is, is important today. Uh, America's racial problems have endured and are likely to intensify as the country's population grows more diverse and the white majority continues to decline. As John Lewis notes, the history of the African-American experience and that of the Voting Rights Act is one of continuing struggle, of reform and reaction, advance and retreat. Therefore, the Voting Rights Act remains in some form an essential tool for maintaining American democracy. The power of the ballot we need in sheer self-defense, the scholar activist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in 1902. Else, what shall save us from a second slavery? Protecting that ballot requires the courage and determination to fight for the gains that the extraordinary generations who came before us paid for in blood. Without a similar commitment today and tomorrow, history may well repeat itself. And again, this popular phrase, you know, you're doomed to repeat it if you don't learn it, I think um, ignores the ways in which history has always continued. Right, the history of Reconstruction, the history of the Civil War is with us. Dr. Hassan Jeffries at Ohio State University is a scholar of uh, the Civil Rights Movement, in particular has an excellent book about Lowndes County, Alabama called Bloody Lowndes, right? uh, which really talks about uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and their work organizing, not just in Selma, Dallas County, but all the surrounding uh, Black Belt counties in uh, central, South Central Alabama. But in this excellent TED Talk, I encourage you to check out uh, that he has about teaching hard history, uh, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, that's H-A-S-A-N Jeffries, J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S. He says that rather than repeating history, his concern is that we are going to continue history, right? That the nation will continue to do the things that created inequality and injustice if we do not remember the past, and in particular, Black history which requires confronting hard truths about the foundational ideals of U.S. democracy. This is the last day of Women's History Month. I'm going to turn to the beginning of the text now, the title in particular, Bending Toward Justice, and discuss a bit about uh, you know, where that phrase comes from, because I think it's, it's, it's really uh, layered here, right? Um, so in this last day of Women's History Month, I want to uplift in our conversation about Gary May's book, The Narratives of Black Women, uh, but more in particular, uh, more generally, uh, black history. Um, 
where we were and where we are in terms of racial progress is often measured through images of black history, not simply race relations, because the question of voting rights is not about how black people relate to white people, right, but about black people's confrontation with power and its relation to voting. I think it's important to start with the title of the text and its reference to an icon who overshadows much of our understanding of the civil rights movement, Selma and voting rights. The title, Bending Toward Justice, derives from an often used refrain from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during his speeches beginning in 1955-56 after the Montgomery bus boycott, repeated again at the conclusion of the Selma to Montgomery march in 1965 in a speech we'll listen to an excerpt of in a second called How Long, Not Long, and in 1967, in his speech titled, Where We Go From Here, just a year before he was assassinated in Memphis, 1968. The short quote is, the, mor the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. However, it derives from a 19th century white abolitionist and Unitarian minister, Theodore Parker, who in 1850 predicted the inevitable success of the abolitionist cause this way. And this is a quote from Theodore Parker. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. And again, put yourself in 1850, right? This country was founded on slavery in 1776. For 100 plus years, slavery has been the law of the land, and you are trying to abolish this system that has prevented, presented so many prophets to this nation. He says, I do not pretend to understand the moral, uh, the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I'm sure it bends for justice. Uh, I thought we might take a second to listen to an excerpt of MLK's celebratory speech, How Long Not Long. And this is a speech given on March 25th in Montgomery after a 54 mile trek, right, through uh, the rural uh, parts of, of Alabama, not on the interstate, right, not on a bus, but by foot. Uh, this is March 25th, 1965. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. This is a short, this two minute excerpt, but I think it's important to try and capture the moment, right, of celebration that marked the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that is in question today, given, uh, what happened in 2013. I know what you're asking. So I'll share my screen and let's see if we can't get um, captions. I don't think we can, um, but I think you should be able to hear this fine. If not, this is a video on YouTube. How long, not long. Hey, how long will it take? Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, How long? Yes, because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How Wrong way up on the throne. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? Not, not, long. not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village oh, where the oh, great of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Lisa. Lisa. He is shifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. That's oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. That's Glory, hallelujah. That's So I am no powerful orator like MLK, but I think it's always refreshing to sit with that energy in that moment. 
Um, and for me, it's refreshing to understand the abolitionist roots of this phrase, bending toward justice, as a moral, not a political or ethical claim about the universe. Uh, I think it's important for us to hold in tandem all, all of those you know, ranges thinking about justice. Um, as a Black professor, I you know, think, what would it mean to be Black in 1850, again, calling for the abolition of slavery? How crazy must you, must you, must you be to think and demand that? Uh, what would it mean to be Black in 1950 calling for the abolition of Jim Crow segregation, right? Uh, and today, with calls for defunding or abolishing the police, I think it's important to hold in tandem this historical invocation of abolition and the forces that have demanded this kind of call for the abolition of slavery, the abolition of Jim Crow, and what this call about policing or police is today. There is a through line that I think is often misrepresented, but I think this... Uh, text, this history of Selma, the organizers who did the work, the legislators who responded, and the fight to renew it really is a uh, important one to think about today and one that I look forward to um, hearing more about your interpretation of and thoughts about um, tonight. So um, a little bit about me. I'm from the South. I'm from Birmingham, and therefore I'm often thinking about Alabama as a pivotal site for change, and it might be soon uh, another site for change, given the kind of vote for uh, Union and Amazon and Bessemer, Alabama. It certainly was in 1965 and 63, and certainly was in 2013 with the Shelby County Beholder decision. Um, so what I'd like to do briefly is go around the room and just get folks' name, what name they would like to be called, um, and what their pronouns are. Um, I'd also like to begin hearing a bit from you, what your impressions were about the book generally, and what questions come to mind that you want on the table that we can return to after we go around the Zoom room, as it were. So I'll let, in my, in my screen, I see Vicky first on my right. And I know Vicky's been at all of our talks, uh, as well as Jimmy and a couple of other folks. So that's always good to see Vanessa as well uh, on the calls. I've, I've tuned in, even though I haven't been um, you know, facilitating the other two. So it's, it's really been a pleasure learning from you all as well. Um, Vicki, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, she, her, and this particular book, um, I have to say I enjoyed all four books, but this is the one that I really enjoyed as a read the most. This is the kind of history writing that I like, that it's told as a story, that you get deep into it almost not as fiction, but in that kind of way. There's the emotion in the story, and it really led to um, build up to the final chapter and the conclusion of what is happening now, and those emotions stay with you. So um, I've already written down his other book to order it and read that one as well. I was really impressed with this author. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Excellent storyteller. Um, excellent storytelling. I, this is my first time reading the book too as a scholar of the civil rights movement and black history. I've, I've read a lot of you know academic texts which do a certain kind of work. I think this text does uh, a different kind of work that's really, really uh, important. Jimmy, you mind going next? Oh, not at all. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I was I was next up on the on the board here. Uh, Jimmy Clark, uh, my pronouns he, he him uh, his I guess. Um, I uh, enjoyed this book um, from the standpoint that it, it filled in uh, I guess the emotional gaps. But I recently read a, a, a I guess it's a biography of Tom Hayden. Um, who was with the uh, Student Democratic uh, uh, SDS um, and got his start with the, the, the Student uh, Nonviolent uh, uh, Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And it, it just kind of all merged together. Uh, my upbringing was on the West Coast and was involved in my, my I guess, my uh, civil uh, unrest involvement had to do with Vietnam War, and that's where Tom Hayden had come into my life and into to my view of things. I was completely divorced from the Southern experience at that time. I've, I've lived here now since 1970, but really had had no um, awareness. And I think that this book really, you know, brings out, like you said, the emotion. Uh, you can see the the YouTube videos. You can see uh, lots of, of action, but it, it it really struck home. 
Um, I have to say that every time I, I read Sheriff Jim Clark, I got little chills and wanted to be sure that there was no misunderstanding that, that I am not he. Um, I say that lightheartedly, but it, it but it's 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 something that I, I think really, you know, makes you stop to to wonder sometimes about, just like you said, Dr. Foster. You know, what would it be like to have been in this world at a different particular point in time, or at a location at a particular point in time? My only disappointment with the book was that it ended in 2012, 2013. It it, it ended before you know the the, the gutting of the of the bill and. With, with the preclearance circumstances and what we've read and, and, and understood from the, the earlier books. Um, and again, given so much that has, has occurred and happened over the last, uh, you know, six, seven years, uh, you know, it, it, that's my only disappointment. Excellent point. I think it's a, an apocryphal kind of tale. He was definitely writing um, to an audience to try and generate public support to understand this history that again, you know, um, there are videos uh, there are oral history interviews. Reading this text really takes you a different journey, I think. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's work um, and legacy. There are so many um, elders today, veterans of the civil rights movement, who never stopped in their demand for justice. And SNCC was a, a site for intense, intense democratic, radical democratic kind of debate about you know, what to do in the face of uh, real mortal danger, right? Uh, and your point about Jenny Clark, uh, so helpful. What would it mean to be a white man in 1965? Thinking about someone like James Reed, who, right, is one of the martyrs of this moment, and someone like Jim Clark, who clearly um, chose a different side in this kind of confrontation. Thank you. I can call on folks. I prefer the voluntary kind of, you know, engagement. We're going to go around the room and everybody's going to have an opportunity to say, you know, a brief word because uh, I want to, you know, again, uh, center your voices as much as possible. Okay, so I guess I'll go. Um, I'm Vanessa Hill. I'm a faculty member in the College of Business, and I study corporate social responsibility. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I come at this from the point of view of an organizational management scholar, particularly focusing on corporate social responsibility. And um, I'm in the business ethics community, and there's a special issue on racial justice in organizations. So I have been particularly interested with this book series. Um, reading it as a scholar, I'm, I'm always seeing connections with how I'm trying to develop a way of talking about the racial justice in the context of business. Um, as a person, it's been difficult to read. Um, it, I always knew that this was going on um, through just stories from my family. Um, I'm from Los Angeles by way of Louisiana. My family left Louisiana in the 30s and the 40s. Um, and on my father's side of the family, they left Alabama and went to Detroit at about that time too. So I heard about these things, um, but to ha it felt like I was experiencing them again. Um, and then with the current events of the day. So I didn't get as far in this book as I did in the other one. So I'll be um, listening. Uh, and also those guides that you provided at the end will be very helpful. But I'm definitely um, thinking about how I can incorporate this for that, um, for that article I'm working on. Thanks. Thank you for those opening remarks. Uh, and I really appreciate your contribution in all of the, the sessions. It's, it's a little, uh, it's helpful to, to know a little bit more about your scholarly orientation, but I appreciate you sort of separating it or integrating it with your kind of personal experience reading this text. I'm often as a black studies scholar, weary of the ways in which we talk about and engage narratives of black pain and trauma. And certainly this book is full of a lot of it. And I think Gary May writes about it in a way that's very, captivating, very visceral for a particular reason. But when I say, what does it mean to be black 
and demand abolition in 1850 also mean, what does it mean to be Black and read this book, <laughs> right? Like, there's a certain way in which the experience of um, Jimmy Lee Jackson is the experience of George Floyd, is the experience of Trayford Pellin, more locally in Louisiana, Alton Sterling. What's the relationship between Black death and the vote? Indeed, King makes a point in the text responding to former President Harry Truman, who said the march was silly, right? <laughs> and uh, I'll get the quote later, but he, you know, he makes a point. Like, we're fighting in uh, the spirit of those who died as much as we're fighting for the right to vote which I think is often missed when we think about this history. Black folk didn't get the right to vote through voting, right? There was a different kind of response to this beast. Um, just to share briefly, uh, Vanessa, and I'll go over some other books too. If you're interested in um, other, uh, I guess, more scholarly texts, academic texts, because this book is scholarly. There's one that might be you know, up your alley in terms of Selma and economic justice um, titled, Why the Vote Wasn't Enough for Selma. Um, by uh, Carolyn Forner. This book came out in 2017, so it's pretty fresh. But she really, you know, uh, does talk about this history of voting rights, but tries to really center Selma over time, which I think often gets lost in our discussion. Um, you know, Selma becomes a static place where all we can think of is the bridge, and everybody was on the bridge. <laughs> it's like, no, right? It was much more complex. People continue to live there, still live there to this day. And often we only think about Selma for the annual bridge crossing jubilee where, right, John Lewis annually took politicians on both sides of the aisle to Birmingham, to Montgomery, and ended in March, early March, for this annual commemoration of this moment of anti-Black violence that is meant to signify something different today, right? And despite it bringing... Um, former attorney general and state senator of Alabama, his name is leading me now, Jeff Sessions, has attended the Jubilee several times, right? So uh, uh, all of the politicians you could think of on the quote-unquote right over the past 20 years, many on the left have gone to Selma to learn something, and yet Congress has yet to take any kind of bold action since 2006 to, to uh, respond to the gutting of the Voting Rights Act uh, that has been being chipped away since 1965. Um, so thank you, Vanessa, um, for, for chiming in. I think that concludes our uh, uh, folk who have been every time uh, to our sessions. Um, and I might uh, pick on some of our students, my students, um, our students at UL, uh, to, you know, introduce yourselves and uh, maybe offer an impression and a question about the text. I know bonus is on your mind, but you also took the time to be here today. So I really respect that as well. My name is Tariana Sattler. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm Tariana Sattler. My pronoun, pronouns are she and her. Uh, what really was interesting about this book is the many examples, like everyone else said, like that's the main thing that stuck out to me was how the uh, real life events tied into the Voting Rights Act. I found that to, it drew me into the book and made me really interested into reading it. And so far, I really like the book. Couldn't agree more, Tyriana. The examples are almost exhausting in the sense that, like, you know, um, there's so much missing from the narrative when we focus on those images of a Black folk being beaten on a bridge or just John Lewis or MLK, that you recognize how patient and diligent and persistent these organizers, local and from abroad, had to be to really push the needle right? <laughs> that was a success in many ways, but it's it, it, so fragile as we can, we can see and we'll learn a bit more. Um, Minyan, do you mind going next? Hi, my name is Mignon Brister, and, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I really enjoyed reading slash skimming this book. Um, it's usually kind of hard for me to read history books, history reading sometimes, but this one was written in more like a story I could tell. So I really liked it. And um, I look forward to actually reading it instead of skimming it. Well, I'm thankful for LEH because, you know, you have this book for a long time for the free, which I think is important uh, just for, you know, public literacy on this on this history. Um, and I would ask, 
you know, for later, what aspects of this story, the drama of it, really brought you in? Because it is a dramatic story that I think uh, needs to be, uh, you know, um, told. So thank you. Sarah? Hey, I'm Sarah. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I really like this book. I I guess I didn't have a comp like a context for the Voting Rights Act. I had listened to some like podcasts about the the bridge and about like Reverend Reeves and stuff, but I didn't know a lot of specifics about the Voting Rights Act. One thing that like struck me because I've been I've always lived in Louisiana. I've always voted in Louisiana, and I've always needed a license. And I actually started voting before I started driving, so I had to go get like the Louisiana special ID or whatever. And after reading this book, I literally called my mom and I was like, did you know there are places where they don't need IDs to vote? And she was like, yes, girl, where have you been? So I fell down this rabbit hole of like voting, um, like voter ID laws. I found out the Louisiana got theirs in 1997. I have like questions about how that was overlooked by the Voting Rights Act. That was just really interesting to me. I guess that was, and maybe it sounds dumb, but I hadn't really considered it in that kind of way because it, it did impact me when I was younger you know and probably lots of other students in my same position no it's really powerful and helpful to think about right your generation's engagement with voting and what that was like 50 years ago what that was like 100 years ago voting is you know supposedly one of the most sacred rights in uh you know liberal democracy um how has that been the case and not been the case, right? In in terms of Louisiana in particular, but, but more broadly in, in the US. Um, thank you. Um, some other folks, I'm not gonna call on y'all, apologies, Mignon, um, for the mispronunciation, but that's part of why I wanna get these names out here so that we can, you know. I get, I get it a lot. Uh, well, you know, uh, that'll make it even better, but I appreciate the, the grace you're showing me. Um, anywho, uh, other folk, uh, your impressions and your questions so we can uh, continue. Patty? Patty, I you, think we can hear you. You have you're to. Muted. There you go. Okay. Thanks. I signed up for all four and have listened to all four. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out. I got into Zoom late, but I've enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, I can't thank y'all enough for picking this up from the library. And I'm actually glad for the controversy because I got to read four books instead of two. And I became so, I've just become, I'm not, I've, it's just opened my eyes to so many things. And um, with everything that's happened, I, I grew up in New Orleans and I grew up in 1963 and Wrote the, you know, I mean, so I experienced a lot of, I mean, but of course I'm white, but I mean, I got up, my dad caught the bus every day to work and I'd get on and, you know, I would wonder why the blacks had to sit in the back, you know, and all, all that. So, and experienced that type of thing. And then I taught an inner city school in New Orleans and I was the only, I was the only white in the entire school and I was not prepared uh, culturally wise. Uh, it's, it's one of my, um, it's an issue for me that I wish that we had programs within our colleges that actually taught African American. If, if you're going to be teaching, and if you're if you're not African American, you're going to be teaching within inner city schools. That that's a whole different ball game of how to approach that. So that that's that has nothing to do with this. But anyway, I've been very interested in all of this. But this this book, I agree with Vicky totally. That out of the four, this one gra grabbed me more, it was less textbook. Uh, our daughter was in from Austin and she saw it on my reading table and she picked it up and she went home and ordered a copy and her husband. So I gave great discussion. As far as HR1, like right now, what's going up, I really, really wasn't paying attention to it in the news. I didn't know. Now it's like every time it comes on and every issue, now that I've read every little part of, you know, it's just been a great, great uh, mind-opening uh, experience. So I thank you, Ellen. I thank all of y'all who have done all the hard work for it. You know? and, and he wanted to participate, but <laughs> he didn't know how to sign up. <laughs> he got one of the books. So. I'm stuck in the 18th century. I'm not too good on IT. <laughs> but 
Exactly. I have watched it with her, and I love that book. I agree with Vicki. That was my favorite book of the uh, three that I read by far, and I agree with the students. It, it, it reads just like a storybook, so it's easy to read. What struck me the most was I always thought I understood Selma. I didn't understand Selma. Yeah. Uh, all the things that happened before and all the critical people, not just Martin Luther King, but many, maybe more critical than him, Definitely. like John Lewis and, and the other people that were in before Martin Luther King. Yeah. Uh, so it was just, just great historical knowledge. And it, uh, like my wife, Patty says, it, it makes you hungry to want to pass HR one and, and stand up for, for voting rights. It's just ridiculous and sad for our country where we are. And Mr. P, could you please introduce yourself as well? We I mean, love I'm Brent Prather. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a he, him, him, his. Oh yeah, I'm her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very uh, much for tuning in. Uh, thank you for, you know, working through the technology mess and we can, you know, tune in virtually. It definitely would have been preferred to be in person and have this discussion. Um, the whole world can see it now and it's being recorded, which, you know, I think had a benefit at the end of the day because I think this is going to be a productive conversation. But I wanted to pick up where, you, you know, you mentioned briefly that, you know, your background as an educator has no role when you sort of asserted that something having to do with race clearly mattered in your experience being in a majority black, um, if not all black, um, um, educational setting. And what one of the kind of myths about the civil rights movement that I think is the most enduring is that, you know, once white people saw and white folk in the North across the, the world, the images in Selma or the images in Birmingham, that there was an attitude shift and that finally, right, these images convinced folk maybe segregation and racism is not okay, and there needs to be some kind of enforcement of it. On page 239 of the uh, May text, he says at the very top, and this is toward the end of the text, right, but the nation is not as different as it may seem, which is a, I think is a key point about how we think about progress. History reveals that improved conditions come less from a revolution in white attitudes toward African Americans than from the act's effectiveness in altering electoral conditions that have prevented blacks uh, from winning elections. In other words, if the act had never existed, there is no guarantee that Mississippi would have uh, so many black public officials, or for that matter, any at all, right? Um, which I think is important to think about, right, the, the rollback of the Voting Rights Act, and in particular, electoral conditions, how laws alter what those conditions are for the possibility of, right, greater representation. Um, um, indeed, it did transform uh, the electorate, uh, but like the Car Car Carolyn Forner book alludes to, and like many of our observations already tell us, right, uh, things are uh, not nearly as bad uh, and things are much worse in a certain ways. So how are we measuring that in relation to this history, I think, is, is really key. So I think we have two other guests uh, to bless us with their impressions and some other questions, uh, as well as uh, their name and pronouns. Hi, I'll go. Uh, I'm Cynthia Sawyer, uh, she, her, hers. Um, I have a lot of impressions about this book. Uh, number one, it was wonderful. And um, why, did, why did I sign up for this series? Um, because it was controversial. I thought it was really, really cool. I need to get in on this. Um, I'm a nurse by profession, and I teach in the College of Nursing at UL. Uh, so from, from that kind of base, uh, I've been extremely interested in social injustices. I am a public health nurse by profession, by career, by passion. Um, so, you know, that's that's been a buzzword for probably 20 years now, but we still haven't gotten a hold on it um, in, in a way that, that I would like to see. And I always look at health from um, well-being standpoint. And of course, you know, social ways of being are, are very important to me. And um, I, I have to say I'm very ignorant about politics. I, I think I grew up in, in a very, very little small town in South Louisiana. I was only like six years old when, when Selma happened. And of course, I didn't know what was going on um, at the time. But um, for me, I was, I'm still 
quite ashamed, I guess, as as a privileged white woman um, growing up in South Louisiana, and and I guess being in a rabbit hole about it all. Um, so you know, come six decades later, it's it's time to get out of that rabbit hole, and and perhaps you know at least talk about it. Um, I, I do not consider myself racial, but I know I am <laughs> just because that's that's the way I grew up. But it's just, you know, trying to expose myself to to different ways of looking at things. Um, I, I did enjoy this book. Um, I was intrigued by the whole political process. And and by the way, Dr. Foster, I sure wish I'd have had your cliff notes before because I am I am 20 pages away from reading every detail in this book. I was trying, I was still here at 515 because I thought that's how you read books for book clubs. Um, but I am just so intrigued by this what I thought was a Republican way of looking at things and then Democratic way of looking at things. And it's all over the place. Um, so it gives me some some food for thought. I just recently changed my voter registration to nothing because it's like I am I am not either of these things. And it, it gives me a little bit more um, more thought and more information to to kind of have a dialogue with my husband who is who is very good at history so for for many ways uh the, this book was very very beneficial and i thank you for having me and um i thank all of you for for sharing your your ideas about this it's it just gives me so much more food for thought thank you that was really helpful um um yeah, I would say at the outset that, you know, uh, you know, I've been teaching at UL since fall 2019, and my best uh, students uh, um, far and away have been uh, Black women nursing students who I think really value a Black history course before they really get into what I know the last two years of the, the undergraduate degree, which is, you know, clinicals and some of my best friends are nurses, so I know a bit about the process uh, and respect the labor, but couldn't agree more that it's really important for nurses to think through, you know, the role race plays in so many aspects of healthcare. I think that, you know, one doesn't have to quote unquote be racial or racist to have race still matter in how you navigate the world, um, how you're identified or not, you know, who are you, <laughs> who gets to vote as often, you know, like, where are you from kind of questions, which I get often, where are you from, uh, Alabama? Well, where were you born, uh, Birmingham? Well, how do I make your kind of phenotype or uh, fit my understanding of race um, and the body that I've encountered in my life? Because now it's troubling. And that, 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 that troubling effect is, is race, not, not me, not necessarily you, but the lens through which we read so much. And I think black history um, really disrupts those, those frames and really um, amplifies our understanding of, of racial politics that are embedded in so much of what we do. Again, when I was researching before this um, um, talk, the uh, title, Bending Toward Justice, I was surprised that it was a, a white abolitionist who you know, coined this this kind of phrase in a theological discussion, but about the immorality of slavery, which, you know, um, I know in a certain way our founders like James Madison, Thomas Jefferson knew, right? But nonetheless, race allowed them to say, well, um, the capacity for this person who's clearly closer to an animal is so low that it's, you know, acceptable for, in the case of James Madison, to have enslaved children literally lay the bricks for the house, the mansion that he has, right, where he would write the Bill of Rights, right? <laughs> but literally, as Hassan Jeffries makes uh, plain uh, clear in his um, TED Talk, and again, I, I'll, I'll put it in the chat because it's so powerful, um, we're not only standing on the shoulders of uh, James Madison, we are literally standing on the shoulders of the ideological and material uh, labor of, of Black boys and girls, <laughs> right? He talks about going to uh, this uh, mansion with his daughter who was playing around and how the kind of docent um, for the museum uh, took him to the basement to show him you could literally still see the fingerprints in the brick, right, from these children um, that, you know, that's part of the contradiction, part of the history. Um, thank you. 
Uh, lastly, I think we have Katie on the call uh, to briefly introduce yourself and, and, and a bit about um, your impressions and questions about the text. Hi, my name is Katie Saltz. Um, my pronouns are they, them. Um, these books have been like really eye-opening for me. I, I'm from Oklahoma and I grew up in the Dallas suburbs mostly. So I was really naive for a long time about just thinking we had already achieved equality. Um, and we moved here when I was in high school and I was just like overwhelmed by culture shock and confronted by like the reality of overt racism. Um, and even just like some of the physical structures here, there's evidence of segregation um, that's still standing. You know, that was really kind of shocking to me. Thank you. Um, um, I couldn't agree. The architecture of, um, you know, the past is, is, is so present in many ways. We overlook, we, I know in New Orleans, there was a kind of ceremony of renaming streets recently uh, that were formerly uh, named after Confederate soldiers. Our university, University of Louisiana Lafayette, is currently going through research um, on the committee for um, about some of the white men who we honored through assigning their name to certain buildings that, you know, um, Black students have to walk through. What is the kind of symbolic violence that's occurring when somebody who supported the Confederacy or somebody who was an architect of the legal effort to reimpose slavery by another name, Jim Crow segregation, right? Um, to be a, a building name. I think that that is a hard history that I'm, you know, proud that UL is, is, is undertaking. Uh, that certainly was the genesis of student activism from this past summer related to the viral video that is being, you know, recirculated in so many ways. I, you know, want to follow the trial as much as anyone, but I also don't for the same reasons Vanessa laid out about reading this book while being Black. I'm not trying to see nine minutes and 38 seconds of whatever they said it is now, and not eight minutes and 46 seconds. It's like, you know, the spectacle of Black death is so much uh, kind of engine for this nation in terms of uh, uh, moments of reform and, and transformational change, which is, you know, one thing that uh, perhaps to start, I think might be productive in, you know, uh, thinking about Selma. Selma is often reduced to King and, 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 and John Lewis, the icons of the civil rights movement and the Edmund Pettus Bridge. What was the impetus for the march? We Then we might go deeper to think about, like, the local... Uh, uh, organizers who since the 1920s, right, have been demanding the right to vote. It didn't just spring up out of nowhere in 65 and these people just decided to cross the bridge, right? There was a process and Gary May is very helpful at showing us, you know, some of the genesis of that process. But, you know, the impetus for the march was the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson, right, who was shot in the stomach and died days later. Uh, it's always, you know, troubling to return to that moment in the text. He says, um, you know, uh, I have been shot. Don't let me die. Lord save me. Those are his last words before five days later, he died from an infection right in his stomach. Um, because the first hospital they took him to didn't have, a, it was a black hospital, right? Uh, cause segregation still meant you had to go to a certain place to be, to receive care. Didn't have the, the resources for a blood transfusion that you needed. So they had to you know, travel up in 30 or so miles to another hospital where the drama of is he or is he not going to die was the national discussion, right? That then came to a head when he did finally die some three, four days later uh, and really required national attention. President Johnson had to speak on that death. And uh, King and those young people who were organizing in Soma said they wanted to take his dead body and dump it on the footsteps of the state capitol in Alabama, Montgomery, before George Wallace, the kind of, you know, um, um, main political leader uh, uh, supporting segregation during that time. This is after George Wallace gave his famous, you know, schoolhouse stand. You know, this is before he became a kind of uh, presidential candidate that garnered, you know, some two plus percent of the, the electorate uh, in, well into the 70s, right, uh, advocating for segregation. I think we have this idea that, you know, 
Voting Rights Act, yay, it's over. But it's like, no, the fight against the Voting Rights Act and for voting rights continued. We just um, sort of lost sight of that of that context. But what did you think about some of the, 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 the genesis of the march uh, and discussion of the march? Um, and you can answer that question or you can take it wherever you want, right? But I just thought Jimmy Lee Jackson, right, is important to center as a young uh, uh, black man who was trying to protect his his um, his grandparent um, during a night march, right in Marion, Alabama. It wasn't in Selma, right, where he was shot and killed. So again, there's a way in which we focus on the singular and lose sight of like this was this was the condition, right? You could be killed at any one point in time. And um, you know the law and, and and policing at the time would not would not save you. In fact, it might be your assailants. The um, person who killed James uh, Dimity Jackson was finally sentenced in 2010. Right, Gary May makes this point. Uh, so justice delayed, certainly justice denied in that in that, in that context. Dr. Foster, a couple a couple points or, or, or thoughts. Um, relative to that that part of the the book, um, first of all, with the, with the Jimmy Jackson circumstance, the way I read it was that uh, he was actually in a cafe. Not it was not during the march. It was post, you know, confrontation, um, and it was obviously um, a continuation of the brutality that would, was being you know in, invoked upon uh, black citizens. Um, the the thing that, that struck me continuously, I, I guess, was the importance of media coverage or absence of media coverage. Uh, and in that instance, the, the Marian circumstance, um, there had been um, apparently a, a very uh, intended, uh, you know, ex, you know, sighting of, of, of news persons, uh, painting their cameras, uh, you know, forcing, beating them. I mean, they were, they were, you know, bludgeons as, as, as well as, 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 as others. Um, but it did not capture the, the attention in and of itself. And yet the subsequent, uh, Selma circumstance was the, not only the capturing of the actual, you know, brutality, the 15 minutes or so, but then just the serendipitous circumstance of the way ABC, you know, put it onto air um, uh, in the middle of a the the uh, 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 a discussion on on Nazi Germany, and to have this 15 minute interruption confront I think they said 48 million viewers in in America, and it just reminds me you know how how important one freedom of the press is. Two, the the importance of, of of elevating in today's world, even you know, images and, and George Floyd's circumstance is certainly a result of a bystander holding you know a, a camera, and it you know causes you to wonder how many things have transpired, gone on, have not changed in this world as a result of us not being able to actually view, see, and and, and experience. So, um, anyway, just some thoughts. No, it's really helpful. I have uh, a lot of thoughts about that, that that context around images and media. Um, and there's a moment in the text we can turn to in terms of the kind of strategy that King deployed. And I'll read a quote from him in a second. But I'm curious other people's thoughts on that context. Um, that you know, it was a night march in which Jimmy Jackson was killed, and the press couldn't capture that moment in the same way. Um, Clearly, it didn't matter for the black folk who were mourning his life and decided to try and dump his dead body, right? But you know, it produced another moment that was captured. Um, but other thoughts about this, this this context, I think it's important to to understand. Patty, you want to unmute? I don't think we can hear you. Uh, yeah, one of the th thoughts that I had, which is it's horrible, but I've started to look closer at a lot closer at everything as far as racism goes. But for uh, Jimmy Jackson, and then I, I, I was counting the days between those three murders of uh, uh, James uh, Breed and then Viola. And it's all within a month's time. And some of, uh, I think between Viola and uh, James, it was like 11 days. And so things were just like picking up, picking up. And one of the thoughts that has bothered me 
is the question of would the Voting Rights Act, I just hate to ask this, but it's just thought, you know, it, you know, those, the, the other two were whites that died. Okay. Uh, you know, and um, it would, uh, did that, unfortunately, during that time, and even now, because of those deaths, did that help make it go faster? I hate to think that, you know, over the, over the first, over, over Jimmy. Just your opinion. I'd like to know your opinion on that. Well, I mean, I have an opinion, but I also have a scholarly kind of position in the role of, you know, okay. these these images of black death. And uh, yeah, I think the law, the history plays out in the ways in which black lives have not been um, adjudicated uh, effectively or justly by the law. So, you know, um, I do have a question in the discussion guide that covers these, these, these murders that we might describe as martyrs, iconic martyrs, because certainly there are other people who suffered greatly and died who we don't know and won't know. Right. So I also want to hold that together. Uh, the seventh question that I, you know, uh, drafted in the discussion guide is many foot soldiers of the civil rights movement became martyrs to the cause of black freedom, including people like James Reeb, uh, Viola Liuzzo, uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, who was killed by a state trooper in Marion, Alabama in 1965. What is the role of mortal sacrifice in the struggle for human rights and black freedom? How should we memorialize, remember those who died and continue to die for the expansion of civil and human rights in the U.S.? In 2010, Denise Jackson, the murderer, pled guilty to the crime 45 years later after, killing, after Jackson's killing. What is the societal value of pursuing justice even after many years have passed? Um, last, I just wanted to read this quote from King, which describes some of his strategy in terms of the, the media which is a double-edged sword, I think, for how we see racism and dumb, right? We want to look for the villains like Jim Clark or Bull Connor and not the everyday casual racism that allows, you know, voter ID laws to get passed, for example, right? Uh, King wrote in Why We Can't Wait in 1964, in between the Civil Rights Act of 64 getting passed and before the Voting Rights Act of 65 getting passed, this book, Why We Can't Wait. Why we can't wait for what? The vote, right? He says, the brutality with which officials would have quelled the Black individual became impotent when it could not be pursued with stealth and remain unobserved. It was caught as a fugitive from a penitentiary is often caught in giant circling spotlights. It was imprisoned in a luminous glare, revealing the naked truth to the whole world. And indeed, that's part of the argument that I think the uh, prosecutors made about the kind of context of George Floyd. Look, it's at the camera, right? But I'm weary of visual evidence being the turning point, either for legal, uh, yeah. uh, for, for legislation, the law, or for justice in terms of adjudication. It's, it's you know, it's a slippery slope. Um, and I'm curious what other folks think about, you know, that strategy that King deployed, which certainly had an impact, but how that strategy is sort of like a double bind of how we get over today. We can't see it. Well, you know, it's not racism. It's just individual attitude or bias. Well, I can't say from what, um, what we know in my area of research is that one of the strongest ways to do an ethical test, like one of the strongest ethical tests we teach is how would you feel about that position if you had to get up in front of a TV screen and get up in front of a group of people and defend that position? Would you be able to defend the action that you're about to take if it were broadcast on TV or advertised in the newspaper? And the reason why that's so effective is that one of the moral imperatives that drives people the most, and I won't call it a moral imperative, but one of the moral motivations in people's ethical development is what do other people think of me? It's a very strong driver, right? So to your first question for his strategy, for King's strategy, he may have, he probably intuited that it is more difficult to still hold on to the um, conviction that you're a good person if you are confronted um, doing these things that are inconsistent with that. And so he effectively used the media in order to do that. Um, as far as the double-edged sword, what I was thinking of when you were talking about these observations was the rollback of the Fair Reporting Act, which was done, uh, I think, somewhere in like the 80s or something like that, which allowed Rush Limbaugh and conservative media to, um, to rise. There used to be on the books um, 
a an act that's or a law that said you news had to report both sides. You couldn't editorialize and pass that off as news. Um, so I think about then um, how that really has influenced what people see, their ability to be able to only listen to the points of views that they perceive they agree with. And I think it goes back to this threshold that you're talking about. So how high does the threshold have to be in order for, um, for you to have enough evidence to, um, to, to be persuaded? Um, so I, I think of all those things as just really relating to each other. Wow, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more in terms of especially what do other people think of me, right? Which requires us to think about the kind of communities we're in or the communities we claim and the communities we don't claim. Who are people for me to be concerned about thinking about me if I don't see them as human or fully human, right? They don't have any political power anyway. They're not going to vote me out of office. I will say what I want to say. My constituents support me. I must support my constituents. Moral, ethical questions be darned, right? It's on page 92 that this commentary from Gary May, uh, he makes about um, images, right? It's the half paragraph that you see at the top of the page. Um, May writes, King's media savviness even affected how he chose cities for new campaigns. A lot of them in Alabama. Each location had to have the personalities necessary to create a morality play, right? So these are scripted. Bull Connor in Birmingham and Jim Clark in Selma were the perfect antagonists, villains the audience would love to hate, arouse the conscience of the nation, King believed, and the government would be forced to act. Images rather than words were becoming critical in shaping public opinion. King's strategy was confirmed that Sunday evening. This goes to Jimmy's point. But, you know, um, images have always been powerful tools of imposing racial domination. The media at the time was at a turning point in terms of television as a new technology, news television, news journalism. So I agree with Vanessa's point about the rise of kind of right-wing talk shows uh, Pierce Morgan was removed in part from the UK because there were regulators who got some like 4,000 or 40,000, I forget which one, an outrageous amount of complaints about his comments about Meghan Markle having to do with race, right? We don't have that same kind of regulation of media. And in some ways, you know, um, um, well, I don't have necessarily an opinion about regulation, but I agree that it, 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 it impacts so much of what gets amplified. Newspaper, obviously, also really important source of media in which Black folk were using to try and humanize themselves. <coughs> and other media were using it to dehumanize Black folk, right? So there is a, a relationship between media as a technology that can be wielded in both ways. I think we're looking at... Um the visual of it, what makes me kind of sad about it is that it it makes it so easy to ignore someone's personal experiences because it's not on camera. And so that's why there are so many people who were, who were victimized whose names we don't know. Because once television became a thing and news cameras were right there with SNCC and CORE and NAACP at the marches, the marches became the focus, not but the 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 catalyst of those marches. Those people who were no longer there kind of got lost in in the narrative that was supposed to be their narrative. Because if I don't see it, it doesn't happen, right? And that's still something we deal with today. If I don't see it, it doesn't happen. If it hasn't been recorded, it doesn't happen. You're making it up, and it makes it really easy to dismiss people's actual experiences because you didn't see it. So clearly, like. Clearly, we deeply believe everyone is lying. Therefore, I can't base anything off of what you say. Only what I've seen. A really important dynamic couldn't be more shay in terms of you know how uh, black testimony is often dismissed. We see it right now in terms of the George Floyd trial. We saw it during the Trayvon Martin trial. Someone like Rachel Jantel was dismissed as a accurate witness of, uh, you know, Martin's death in um, 2012. Um, 
I'm curious your thoughts about some of the quote unquote, I hate these terms, unsung heroes, hidden figures, because I'm asking unsung to who, hidden from who and why, right? It's sort of a backhanded compliment in terms of someone who's important, but they're just unsung hero. They can't just be a hero. Uh, I'm thinking about people like uh, Bernard Lafayette, who the book opens with, right? Who's still very active in producing nonviolent, um, uh, nonviolent philosophy and training, which I think is a strategy that clearly others in the book disagreed with in certain times to certain to different effects. But uh, Albert Turner, Hosea Williams, Jim Bevel, um, Marie Foster, Annie Lee Cooper, Annie Lee Cooper. There are a number of names that are covered in the book. Um, I'm curious for those of you who were interested in the drama of it, which narratives really captured you that. You know, there are whole books written about these people because they're that significant, but May decided to weave them into his narrative toward a certain effect. Well, as you mentioned, uh, the book starts with Bernard Lafayette, and that is the one that really impacted me because it kind of set everything in motion. And at the time that he was starting, he knew how important Selma could be, but he was arguing with others about how important it was going to be and whether or not that was really forethought on his part and clear thinking at that time or after the fact realizing that, or us all realizing that he had it right. But would history have gone the way it did? Would we have had the action at the time we had the action if he hadn't taken the chance that one summer to do what he did? And he's that person who just started the ball rolling and then just quietly was there, but not acclaimed. A kind of butterfly effect. How old was he? If we can just double check so we can think about maybe the role of black youth in these changes. I think he was yeah, 23. Young. Yeah, young. 23. Yeah. 23 or 19. I think he was 23. Um, but very young. These are very, very young black people who are traveling to places where, again, um, it is socially, legally acceptable for you to be killed, lynched, uh, white or black. If you are supporting this kind of cause, um, the law will not follow. And someone mentioned violent use so before. Did you all catch toward the end how the FBI had to criminalize in a narrative, a false narrative about Val Uso in order to get uh, a witness to, to take the stand in order to put the white supremacist who killed her in jail. They gave $10,000 in witness protection to a known bloody Klansman, right? Uh, I think there's a, a way in which you can think about the complexities of the history of policing if people are today really critical of or, or, or skeptical of the demand to defund or abolish the police. I think we really need to sit with the context of policing and law enforcement uh, during this time, if we are to recognize the change over time and racial progress or some continuities between how black communities are policed, right? I had a question. Tyana, please drop um, some knowledge. <laughs> In chapter one, uh, the book, well, the book basically stresses the importance of voting and uh, how essential it was for blacks to vote in reference to freedom. Um, he talked about one of the evidence says the evidence on page. Ooh, I forgot the page. I'm all have to find it. But it says our big problem was the Negro himself who wouldn't risk the possible loss of his job and other kind of hardships just to vote. And I feel like the three words that stuck out to me was just to vote, like the way he put just to vote, like it wasn't really, a, the people that didn't vote, the blacks that didn't vote, didn't look at voting as such a big deal. They didn't think it was worth losing their um, job. So my question was like, was the concept of voting or the right to vote not understood to many blacks or was it not important enough for them to uh, not wanna take the risk for the freedom? That's an excellent question. What do you think? Where, 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 where do you, you know, stand on that kind of uh, context? I think you know, I'll add a little bit more to it here in a second, but um, um, it seems as though you were implying a kind of response, but 
you know, I think this is a, a difficult question and it's a difficult answer. I feel like they understood, but although they understood, they I feel like they more appreciated what they had now and they felt like it was a much bigger risk to act upon it than it was not to. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think we can underestimate the kind of specter of lynching and racial violence um, that terrorized Black communities from 1890 through the 1960s, right? Um, there was very real understanding of retribution and you losing your job because of your actions. Rosa Parks had to move to Detroit because she couldn't get a job after 1955 when she participated in the Montgomery bus boycott, right? Her husband lost his job. He became an alcoholic. She suffered greatly for her contribution as an icon. Imagine people who weren't icons, whose employers could really just fire you quickly and, and then, you know, you suffer. I think it's important to think about what makes Selma an ideal place in this first chapter. Vanessa, are you ready to chime in? Yeah, what I was going to ask the question of, um, on that I was thinking, um, do you think it was that they appreciated what they had now or was kind of a almost a... Um, they were strategically measuring the likelihood that something would actually change if they made that sacrifice. So it's kind of like, okay, I, I make that sacrifice, I lose my job, but if I do this and nothing changes, then what's the point? So I'm wondering as you ask that question, if maybe some other kind of calculus was going on and not necessarily like, oh, I really appreciate this job that I'm being underpaid for that I have, or like saying, okay, so I have these two options. Where am I going to be most effective? You know, um, choosing when I lay it down on the line strategically so it has the biggest effect. No, I think you might be referring to page 42, um, where they're trying to discuss, right, the Dallas County Voters League, which was founded in the 1920s by uh, a man whose name leaves me now, but really, you know, expanded under Amelia Boynton Robinson and Sam Boynton, a couple who kept up the fight for registering Black folk to vote from 1920 to, to 1940. Certainly they were making a kind of calculus about their uh, support for an organization that was counter to the law, that was counter to those in power, and therefore put a target on their backs. Um, what do other people think about this um, context in which, you know, one of the best books on the civil rights movement is by Charles Payne uh, called I've Got the Light of Freedom about the Mississippi organizing tradition. And he goes to great length in the first chapters to really detail this kind of context of racial violence while also detailing the kind of continuities of resistance that, you know, Black folk never stop fighting for their freedom. Uh, and their freedom wasn't equal, equal to voting. Their freedom wasn't equal to integration. Their freedom was equal to something, you know, closer to liberation, which, you know, might be uh, in this country, might not be in this country, but might be in a white community, might not be in a white community, might be teaching in an all-black school, might not be teaching in an all-black school, right? The kind of yeah. freedom dreams of black people were, were structured by this, this context. Um, I think what's really interesting is because I feel like the realities of voter suppression from Reconstruction through the 1970s has been, I don't want to say sensational, like it's moved almost, it's like weirdly moved in almost to a place of myth that people don't believe it was as bad as it was. Like we've seen it, we've, 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 we've seen it in film, we've read about it in fiction. And people don't believe it was that bad. People don't understand the gravity. And so those statements is like, just for the, just to vote. When you're thinking of to vote, when you're not, you don't have the political power to make a difference and you're going, you they, they can literally possibly burn down your house. They could firebomb your house. Your wife could lose her job. Your husband could lose their job. Your children can become criminalized as, as adults, as children. Like you could be lynched. You're, they are, they could do worse. There's so many things just to vote. And there's a framing there that has kind of followed Black communities. Like we're still kind of having these conversations around the importance of voting. And it's been used to justify or to 
paint a picture like black people don't care about voting. And that's not what it is. Like black people have always understood the power of the vote, but they also understood they didn't have the numbers and the system was not for them to gain the right to vote, to make a difference that was worth them risking their life. Like I don't have children. If I had children, I'd have to think about what's going to happen to my kids if I do this or what's going to happen to my husband if I do this. Like these are things and we've heard this narrative so much. We don't listen to it anymore. It's just kind of become theatrical backdrop <laughs> to so many things. But that's one of the great things. Like there's there's truth in it. There's there's literal documentation that this backdrop is based off of that we don't engage with anymore. No, that's really helpful, Shay. And I think it's also important to to point out, you know, these are also intergenerational uh, kind of context for organizing and disagreement, right? Um, there's a really good <clears throat> uh, fiction, but rooted in this book by Charles Payne, I got a, a lot of freedom, a, a film called Freedom Song, featuring Danny Lover. That's really, 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 really good. That really teases out this tension and context between a son who's really enamored with the work of SNCC and somebody who I must invoke in this moment, who's still with us to this day, but someone who's not in the best of health and Bob Moses. He's not really talked about in this book at all because it's not really about Selma. Bob Moses was really active in Mississippi and one of the just savvy organizers who really knew how to enter a community and really develop relationships and not come and shake things up immediately, but get the buy-in of old folks who were, again, part of these 1920s, 1930s uh, voter organization, uh, labor organizing groups, right, that knew where the guns were when you needed the guns to protect yourself, knew how to sneak you out the back when uh, vigilantes were coming to lynch and kill you, burn your building down, right? So this tension uh, is certainly within the Black community, but it's also about generations, right? It's also about strategy. How do you respond to an impossible situation? This is the point I made earlier. About what does it mean to be Black and say, we should abolish slavery in 1850? 620,000 people would die in the Civil War. That's uh, people on the battlefield, not civilians. That would come, right, 11 years later. But you had to be pretty out of your mind I'm saying in a good way, right, Uh, in terms of a a radical imagination to think that you could overturn those relations. Um, And they did. And then they did again. (laughs) And then, you know, we're still in that kind of process, unfortunately. Uh, We got about 13 minutes left, uh, but I wanted to um, have folks who didn't have the opportunity to ask questions just yet or otherwise contribute to, to, to speak on whatever issue comes up. I have some discussion questions we can turn to, but... Uh, what do you all want to want to get out here? Well, I found the piece of evidence. It was on page fifteen at the top of the page. Now, Tariana is an excellent student because I like the receipts. Because you know, historians don't just write what they want to write out of the blue. We can dismiss it as partisan as a result. But if there are facts, right, that exist that are known and unknown, how are you weaving, how are you weaving them together, right? Um, how are you analyzing them, right? What are the implications of, of these facts? Um, I was thinking about um, you, Cynthia, with uh, this discussion about uh, Marie Foster on page 14, who was a dental hygienist who went on to play, you know, an important role in uh, the Selma movement. Um, thank you, Tariana. Other folk, uh, Minyan, you got anything for us in these last minutes? Yes, sir. Um, I, I I saw this one word a lot throughout the um, book, and I I understood the book like I said, but like some some things I just didn't. So. Um, Thank you for being honest. I, yeah. I also have to learn and go to the dictionary often too. Please. Yeah. So um, yeah, on page eighty nine, um, it says Charles Boner, Lafayette young recruit, picked up a brick and was about to throw it at at a posse or post posse man when Jim Bevel stopped him. And 
what I wanted to ask was, did they refer to all all marchers as posse? I don't really know how to say the word, but what like what is a posse man? And if they did refer to all marchers like that, then why? Like I looked it up and I just I just kept seeing it throughout, and I just wanted to know. I think that's a good question, and I think it gets us to a more critical understanding of police and policing. If we go a bit further up in the, the paragraph, I think uh, we have a better understanding. Um, I'll read the, the beginning of it. Uh, the rampage continued, and this is the confrontation on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, right? Um, <clears throat> troopers patrolled the streets, attacking any black citizen they could find. Get the hell out of town, they commanded. We want all the N-words off the streets. They entered the Carver housing project, chasing people and throwing tear gas tear gas canisters into buildings. More than 150 officers gathered near Brown Chapel, where a few were pelted with bricks and bottles. Charles Bonner, Lafayette's young recruit, picked up a brick and was about to throw it at a posse man, a posse man referencing the police, right? He does use this term often, I think, to try and describe a certain segment of violent police officers who are there to crack heads open who are there to enforce the law and disperse protesters. We see this same kind of um, hyper-violent response to folk who are protesting in the streets today. But the posse man, he does use this term often throughout the text, and I agree. It's a little funky, because to me, I would just refer to them as policemen, right? Because they are law enforcement officers, but they're serving a particular role in this confrontation that um, Gary May uses to, to, to determine but great question. Well, does, does that make sense? Please, Vicki. Well, I was going to ask if the use of posse also then allows him to include those people who were not just policemen, but who self, well, to use a term that we use a lot now, militia. They've made themselves part of the police in quotes or the militia or the people out there protecting, but they weren't official. Wow. Thank you, Vicki. I think that's really helpful. And it, it gets to a critical distinction that within Black studies, I think is important about police and policing and the ways in which we, anybody in this Zoom call, could be deputized by the law to enforce the law that might result in unintended violent consequences. For example, the George Floyd case. Remember what started the, uh, what brought the police. It was a counterfeit bill. The store clerk was the person who in that moment, because they could lose their job if they don't report counterfeit money, was deputized by the law to respond to this criminal act or of him trying to pay for it. And apparently George Floyd tried to make the case, let me just pay for the, 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 the whatever I'm buying, right? You know, it, this is a counterfeit bill. So we don't know if he knew if it was counterfeit or not. But the fact that it was, was a, 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 a kind of method, a mechanism that was in place that spurred all these other chains of events. So. You know, that is a contemporary context that I think we can import into this historical context of how many white men found great pleasure and purpose in violently supporting Jim Crow laws. They didn't have to be police officers to recognize, right, um, that the law is going to protect them when they do, even on tape, uh, you know, bludgeon someone. <laughs> Again, this... Uh, Alabama State Trooper who killed Jimmy Jackson didn't serve any time until 2010. Uh, so it was, you know, well known in that moment that you could be a part of the posse for the police um, if you wanted it, if you desired it, right? If you wanted to maintain a certain uh, order, which this Voting Rights Act and the man for the ballot is bringing into question, right? We got about seven seconds left. Uh, one thing that I'm interested in your all's opinion on or thoughts on is one of the questions I had in the um, um, discussion guide about uh, post-raciality or what it means to be in a post-racial society. I think it's a way uh, to perhaps close the conversation. Um, you know, the notion of racial progress is the argument that Chief Justice John Roberts used in 2013 to remove the Voting Rights Act. The idea that we have more Black elected officials was a key rational in the eyes of the Chief Justice, Justice of the Supreme Court, a rational reason to um, remove this kind of preclearance for the South. 
that the South has a history of systemic racism is not a fact, according to uh, John Roberts. And that, quote, the Voting Rights Act was a extraordinary measure for an extraordinary time that has since passed because Barack Obama, because uh, Mayor Ray Dayton, because X number of elect black elected officials. But as Gary May notes, how many black governors have there been since Reconstruction? Right? We have Oscar Dunn during Reconstruction. Uh, black man in Virginia was elected in 1969. And I think another black man in the early you know, 1990s, I forget his name right now, but only three black governors have we had since Reconstruction. And governors hold a lot of power in terms of redistricting, in terms of apportioning resources. Um, what do you all think about this idea of us being in a post-racial society that was celebrated at the time of the election of Barack Obama, right? But clearly, the turn of events, as Gary, Gary May notes, what happened in 2010, right, with not only the U.S. Senate and the House going to a uh, kind of conservative Republican Party, but also all these state legislatures, the governor and both houses being, you know, controlled by uh, kind of uh, uh, one party. Um, what do you all make of this, you know, this history in this book and where we are today? I think I wrote in my book, like in the margins, after he said the thing about Obama being, oh, he said that, um, quote, now it's a very different nation in the age of Obama. I literally wrote in my margins that age like milk <laughs> because <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, maybe people who think we live in a post-racial society don't live in the South. I I'm not sure, <laughs> but I've never been able to feel like that, even when Obama was president, you know? My, my only comment to that, Sarah, would be it's, it's not just the South. Um, I, I think that taking a look at all the, the laws that have been uh, proposed in, I, I forgot what the number of states is now in terms of voter suppression, uh, voter ID in, in the last year and a half causes great alarm, that it's it's not a geographically isolated circumstance. And, and certainly, I would say that we are not post-racial in any sense. Yeah, this is on page 237, uh, the last uh, chapter, chapter nine, the struggle of a lifetime. He says, Obama's unprecedented election gave rise to the hope that America had become a post-racial society, a hope that led many, including John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, to wonder if perhaps the Voting Rights Act had outlived its usefulness, right? And that was in 2009. And this is not a, a new idea or desire, right, that the U.S. is just, we're done. Right, <laughs> but forget the foundations, you know, and its legacies today. Um, other thoughts? Well, I was just going to say that we keep, keep seem to keep doing that in this country of assuming because we get the positive benefits of regulations and rules that we put in place that somehow then we've corrected the human nature and behavior that needed those rules to begin with. And I thought of that when Vanessa mentioned um, the elimination of fair, because it's the same thing. We said, oh, our news is now equal and fair, so we don't need a regulations to keep it equal and fair. And what happened when we got rid of it? Stopped being. And it's the same thing we did with, oh, we don't need the preclearance. We don't need some of these actions of the voting rights because we've solved it all. But the second we get rid of it, we start proving that by human nature, we haven't actually corrected that behavior. Then regulations are still needed. I, 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 very good point, Vicki. Very good point, I think, to, to, to start to take us home. I, I don't know if I would say it's natural human behavior to utilize race in the ways that it has been in this, in this nation and since 1500. Um, but your point about the kind of relief, the sense of victory, once a legal change happens. And we can't, again, underestimate the significant transformation that occurred because of the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the blood that was literally shed to have it enacted, right? But 
if all it took was 50 years later for a Supreme Court justice to say, we got enough racial progress, there's no widespread voter discrimination that exists, um, it shows the precariousness, precariousness of those laws, that all it takes, right, is a, a certain um, um, set of individuals to make that kind of choice. And then, right, say, it's up to Congress to prove that there is widespread voter discrimination. And I have little confidence in this Congress, right, to make those kinds of observations and legal changes. It's all the more impressive in this book, the work that Congress had to do under those conditions without word racist in Mississippi and South Carolina to still get this Voting Rights Act passed was the narrative that Gary May tells, something we didn't talk about much tonight. Really um, impressive. And Linda May Johnson was no, you know, uh, uh, friend to Black people in many ways, right? But certainly um, found the political will to get so many people across different aisles to, to enact some teeth to enforce um, what should have been enforced, I don't know, in 1776 or 1865 after the Civil War. But we see this kind of, you know, strategy continuing. So um, thank you all for this excellent conversation. I wish I could have more kind of collectives like this that aren't just brilliant students like Tariana, Mignon, and, and, and Sarah to talk to. Uh, this is some of the kind of conversation we have in class. And, you know, I, I always like to, to, to engage a broader public in those within the walls of academia. So um, thank you uh, for your time tonight. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Shay, who's gonna take us all the way home. You guys have been great and you should give, you all should give yourselves a round of applause for participating and engaging with these texts the way you have. This has been an amazing experience. I'm so glad for everyone who's been able to participate, especially those um, who've, been, who've been with us since day one, those who have been watching um, via YouTube, through the library's website, the library's YouTube channel, and the Acadiana Community Media um, YouTube's channel. Thank you, Acadiana Community Media, for also live streaming this for us and helping us share this with as many people as possible. Thank you to all the people across campus who helped us make this um, this event uh, successful. And before you guys go, please check the chat box. I did put the um, survey. We the, the funding agencies do need those surveys. So please, please, please take time to fill that survey out and submit it. Um, again, thank you guys so much. I hope everybody, um, if you don't follow the university, uh, the different colleges, the College of Liberal Arts, the Ernest J. Gaines Center, the university libraries and archives for our, our events that we do do throughout the year. Please follow us on our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some YouTube. I know the Gaines Center has a YouTube channel. The library has a YouTube channel. So just definitely reach out to us. Feel free to contact me. My name is Shaylin Woods. Feel free to email me if you have any questions or interest in any events. I am here to help in any way I possibly can. Dr. Foster? Really quick, uh, just to conclude and celebrate LEH for their excellent work because these humanities foundations put the program together. We're just facilitating it, okay? Um, Wednesday, April 21st. It's two weeks from now. Um, one of the authors of uh, the series, Martha Jones, will be in conversation with Northwestern historian Leslie Harris. So if you enjoyed these conversations and you enjoyed that book, uh, even if you didn't read that book, that's going to be a really excellent conversation I'm going to uh, check out to conclude LEH is who gets the book. So just want to throw that in. Yes, definitely. Also, if you don't follow LEH, follow LEH. They have lots of awesome oh, um, events as well. And, and also 64 Parishes is a great resource to learn more about your local state history. Again, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for hanging out with us for a month. And I hope you enjoy the books and keep sharing the books and engaging these conversations. We're here to discuss. We're here to be friends. And I hope you all have a safe and pleasant night. Good night, everyone. Bye.